Good morning. Please stand in body or spirit for the reading of the gospel. This is one of my favorite messages. I'm reading from Mark 10, verse 35 to 45. James and John, sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Appoint us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to appoint, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to get angry with James and John. So Jesus called them all up to him and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. You got to love these brothers, James and John, sons of thunder, as Jesus names them. You got to love James and John because they are bold enough to say out loud what most of us would never dare admit that we wonder and worry about whether we're doing enough to get on God's good side, to be close to Jesus. Well, Lord help James and John and Lord help us because here we are imposing human hierarchies onto heaven. While Jesus is trying to get us to look at how we are living on earth. He flips this whole question from James and John about who's going to be on the right or the left on its head, and he poses his own questions in return. Can you drink the cup I drink? Meaning, this cup that literally holds the wine that represents my blood, my sacrifice, the cup of suffering, of sharing, of forgiveness, of service, the cup that embodies communion with all. Can you drink that cup? And are you going to ever finally be baptized in the same baptism as I am? Meaning, are you going to die to yourself and rise to walk in a new way of living the way I am showing you how to walk? You see, these are behavior questions for the here and now. They're not belief questions about the hereafter. At the heart of this text 
is a truth I think we all need to hear, especially in this final stretch of the presidential election. Asking about being on the right or the left is not the question. The question is not about your preferred position or perhaps even your preferred lifelong political party. The question is, where are the people? Where is the suffering? Where is the place of greatest need for service? And are you voting in service of those people, that need, that pain? You see, Jesus says quite clearly, the way to be near to me is to be near to my people. And this is not a passive action. He's talking about drawing near to people with intention and urgency in service. And not just any people, but the people who do not have power and privilege. The people who do not yet have a place. The people who have been displaced. When I read the Gospels, I, I really can't see any place that Jesus is super concerned about who has or who is earning, quote, the best seat at the table. All he cares about is that every person has a seat at the table and that we never stop pulling up the chairs. In fact, this is what I was wondering about this week. I wonder if he's even sitting down at the table at all. Because if we believe that he is reflected in each and every person, then if all people are not around the table yet, if we don't all have a seat, then neither is Jesus, right? The fullness of his spirit is not there yet. You see, Jesus' passion is about and for the people who have yet to find their place at the table, and until they do, he cannot sit down. And if he can't sit down, we can't either. Jesus' passion, we see this throughout all the Gospels, not just in this text that talks about serving others and flipping hierarchies, but Jesus' passion, his priority throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is, is all about service, not success. Humility, not hubris. He thinks about those who are left out, left behind, not those who are leading already. His passion is for the vulnerable, the marginalized, for women, especially widows, for children, especially orphans, for poor folks, even those from areas and places that have different beliefs. Think of the Samaritans. His, his priority is those with disabilities, illnesses, diseases, those who are hurting. And if you think about it, I think his priority, his passion, is for people who maybe grew up like he did. He was the kid of a teenage mom who was pregnant before she was married, by the way. His dad was a blue-collar worker. I imagine that he thinks of himself as one who is grappling with his identity as a little boy in the Jewish faith, but he was born without stable or permanent housing, right? And this is all because of a government edict, a census that was order, reminding us that these, um, these policies, these things that we proclaim, they actually do have actions and ramifications. And he grew up not only just being born in a place that was not, you know, where his mom was from, but he grew up in dangerous times under a maniacal tyrant who wanted absolute authoritarian power, who made absurd claims like kill all the little baby boys under the age of two because I'm worried that one of these little children is going to have more power than I do, right? That's what Herod thought. And so Jesus and his parents, they fled this threat of political violence. They went to another country seeking refuge. He was just a toddler. He had already moved multiple times as a child, crossing a border once and then again. And he defied the odds 
grew up to go to trade school, become a carpenter, likely mentoring under his father, perhaps. And then he followed a dream, a call from God that required him to go out into the wilderness that tested and tried him, that really taught him how to be a nomad, to, to travel around to where people were, where the gospel good news needed to be, not to choose to get married or have children, but to live a single life with friends who would become his companions. I mean, really redefining and expanding our idea of family values, right? And not only that, not only did he live that way, he had a cousin, he had a relative who was a prisoner. Somebody imprisoned, John the Baptist, the very one who had baptized him, who was beheaded by the state. Jesus knew what it was to be not only close to those on the outsides and margins, but to be one on the margins himself, certainly in what we think of today's terms. He was more comfortable at the tables of sinners than the sanctimonious, and he really just liked to connect with people, hear their stories, and see how forgiveness and healing might make a difference in their lives, drawing them into not only his love, but the love of God pointing them toward the kingdom, toward a different reality of hope. Jesus was drawn to people who at least liked the notion of laying everything down for love. I think his disciples really struggled with that, as we all do, but that was his hope in calling these disciples around him. And people in his day thought he was out of his mind. But the very people who thought that are the, are the ones that Jesus would draw near to again. It shouldn't surprise us that Jesus had a passion for people who were hurting. If we understand the context of God's love, if we think about Jesus as God's love incarnate in human form. And yet it should cause us to wonder are these same people being prioritized in the policies that we vote for? Are they represented in, in the leadership that we want to guide us? Jesus prioritizes people. And I'm going to make the argument today that lucky for us, that means he cares about politics. Do you know what the word politics means? It just refers to how we organize together to care for one another, right? It comes from the root word polis, which is like a, a city center, the, the community, the place of gathering. It goes all the way back to um, Aristotle, who really put this into our imaginations, his work entitled Politics. The things concerning the polis, the center of how we operate as humans. And Aristotle said that these city groups, right, these polises, we had to have a politic to figure out how to care for one another, how these groups of people would function. And interestingly, back then, the idea of polis, of cities, of politics, actually didn't just include the people therein, but also the land. There was really a holistic understanding of that connection. Now, I think we've probably all forgotten this. It's pretty easy to do because we think politics means partisan. Politics means polarizing. It's probably the last thing that we think of when we think about caring for one another. And I don't know about you, but just the word politics, just the, anybody getting an insane amount of text messages? This, the text messages on our phone, the inundation of vote for this, do this, don't do that, it is wearying. Perhaps you have found yourself in the last several months um, laughing so hard because it helps you not cry, right? Or maybe you've had 
a, a renewed sense of hope and invigoration and you're out there getting out the vote and you feel like change is on the horizon. Maybe you feel despair and worry and anxiety and are literally sick at your stomach or, or having trouble breathing or sleeping. Maybe you feel overwhelmed or confused or apathetic about it all. Maybe you feel all these things at once or ebb and flow between them all. And I would say this is very human. Feel the feels, right? We're in a heightened state right now in our country and a lot is at stake. So give yourself grace in all of the ups and downs. And, and I want to remind you though that they're just feelings. We can live and breathe and work through our feelings, but feelings are not how we live out the gospel. Actions are. And if politics is really about how we organize as a people to care for people, then not only did Jesus care about politics, we must too, right? You know, I think Jesus is so taken aback by James and John's question here. I mean, they, they, they pretty much go to him and demand him to do whatever they want, right? Which is bold. But I think that he's kind of perturbed because directly before today's passage, Jesus is walking with his disciples on the way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, remember, the place where the final days of his life is going to take place, where this, you know, arrest and trial and crucifixion will happen. Jesus is walking with them, and he tells them about his suffering and trials and death for the third time. For the third time, Jesus foretells what's going to happen to him. And it's in this context of Jesus basically saying, look, friends, this is going to happen to me. It's going to be a hard time. There's going to be a lot of suffering coming up. I'm going to need you with me. This is how I imagine the the uh, extra words around his conversation going. He's just shared this with him. And then here are James and John saying, oh, that's nice, Jesus. I'm sorry that's going to happen to you. But um, what about later when we're all in heaven? Can we sit on your right and left? <laughs> it's like, where is the sensitivity? Where is the awareness? But, you know, I think we can think empathically about James and John here. They seem insensitive, they seem obtuse, they seem sort of power grabbing in this moment. But maybe they're just afraid. Maybe they're afraid because Jesus, their leader, is telling them that he's going to die. He's not going to be with them. Maybe they feel out of control and they don't know what the next step is. Things are changing so fast. They don't know where to put their anxiety, what to do with their grief. And so like all of us, they may do something that's not quite rational or not quite on their best behavior, so to speak, but it makes them feel good to not really think about what's happening here and now, but to think about something in the future. Fear makes us insecure. Fear heightens uncertainty. Fear makes us cling tightly. It's the, it's the opposite of release, right? It's grabbing and gripping. Fear keeps us from having any room to receive new thoughts or curiosities or ways of understanding. Fear makes us more and more insular, drawing in, into what we already know or what we think we know. And fear makes us forget and even forego our values at times. As people of faith, we are called to consider the values of Jesus, the values of Christ, how he lived his life, how his life shaped the world around him, and let those values sink into us and challenge us. Those values actually should sh shape our, our votes, right? And not just our votes, but our actions. Elections come around once in a blue moon, but our actions are every day. How are your values shaping how you act in the world? 
Because in moments of anxiety and fear, just like James and John, we can jump to other lines of thinking. We can forget what we have been taught by Christ, and we can say, well, what really matters is, is am I on your right or left? Am I high enough in this stratus? Am I doing what needs to be done? And all of a sudden, we forget about all the other people because we're concerned about ourselves. It feels like, and I know I, I've only lived four decades, right? One and a half of which I probably don't even remember. So I'm young. But it feels like we are holding so tightly to our identity as Democrats or Republicans or independents that we've forgotten our identity as Christians. You know, what it means to be a Democrat or a Republican, that has changed <laughs> over time, right? It used to be that one party represented the intellectual elite, now another one does. It used to be that one represented the, the working poor or those in the rural areas, now another one does. It used to be that one party respected the institution of tradition and government, and now it seems another one does. Partisan politics shift and change, the pendulum swings, but our values must remain consistent. We must vote our values, because if we vote our values, we're taking politics seriously, and if we take politics seriously, we're taking people seriously. And ultimately, that is the call of our faith. We cannot follow the gospel. We cannot follow Jesus without considering others. So what do I mean by this? I'm going to give you one concrete example, just one. There's so many issues, and, you know, we are all free-thinking people, and you're going to come to your own conclusions. But I just want to give an example of what it means to think about the values of Christ and the wisdom that we read in Scripture as a way to shape in new ways how we think about issues. Let's take immigration. Borders are man-made. Yes, some of them are natural, like rivers and mountains and things like that, but people decided where they would be and who would be in certain categories. People's lives are God-made, right? We believe we all reflect God's image. Now, immigration is a very complex issue, lots of factors to consider, but I wonder, when we think about that in terms of pros and cons and what's the right way to think about this and what we should do, should we pray what we pray every week, that the kingdom of God on heaven would come to earth? Because how many of us think of the kingdom of God as separated by borders? I mean, maybe I'm influenced by art from my childhood or, childhood or imagination, but I imagine that the kingdom of God of heaven is everybody all together, right? All one. Ethnicities, you know, backgrounds, ages. There's no categories. There's no separation. That is the vision, right? That's the kingdom of God. If that's the vision, then that should be what we're trying to implement here on earth prioritizing the people above where they are from or where they're not from. But so often we turn that around. We get to thinking about what is ours and theirs, us and them, when the reality, the entire earth is God's, and all children are God's children. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, might we think about what it means for what we value and how we vote? And the last thing I want to say as you think about this pa passage is that Jesus' passion is not only about the people. Jesus' passion also directly refers to his suffering. You know that Jesus' suffering and death, it's referred to as the passion, right? 
It's the Latin word passio, which means suffering. Not only has Jesus just told his disciples that he's going to suffer and die right before this exchange, he also references the cup and baptism, which also have references to dying and to suffering. And then we hear that his life is going to be given as a ransom. Now, some of us might read that and think of atonement theology, of God you know, saying Jesus had to die for all the sins of humanity. But biblical scholars tell us this is actually a very specific ransom that's being referred to here. The word is litron. It means compensation required for re release or redemption of property. What's being referred to is Jesus exchanging his life for Barabbas. Do you remember Barabbas? The one who was actually on death row, if you will, the one who the leaders asked the people, do you, do you want us to kill Barabbas? And they said, no, we want you to kill Jesus. And when given a chance to speak up for himself, Jesus is silent. Pilate asks him, aren't you going to answer? Aren't you going to say something to what they're saying? But the text says, Jesus made no reply. This is a demonstration of deep sacrifice and an embodiment of love to say that life is valuable. No matter what Barabbas did or didn't do, I think Jesus is making a point to say his life is worth something. And of course, so is Jesus's. It's just that the people who are demanding this can't see that it doesn't have to be either or, that it can be both and. Jesus makes a choice that day, a ransom, if you will, that can only be born from love, from a belief that every life matters, that people are important. Which brings me back to passion. If Jesus had to suffer and die and go through what he did to get to resurrection, and if we believe we're the body of Christ today, right? that we're the ones who embody who Christ is in the world, then that means before we get to resurrection and before we get to new life, there will always be suffering and sacrifice. We can't avoid it. So if it feels like sometimes thinking of the rights or, or uh, values or things that other people need is impending on your life, if that feels like a sacrifice, if that feels uncomfortable, that kind of sacrifice is what is needed for all to be liberated. We suffer together, we die together, we rise together. That's the gospel, that's the, the hope of God's love for all, but it's not just for the hereafter, it is for the here and now. And it is meant to provoke us to good deeds, to creating good in the world with all that we do. Just when we think hope is lost, nothing is possible, everything is pointing toward death, Jesus reminds us resurrection is around the corner. New life, second chances, hope. It's always in the future, but that road to resurrection is not easy. So we are in it for the long haul, and we are in it with one another. That's the passion that drives us to the poles, because it matters. And may I remind you that whatever happens on election day, no president is our savior. We have one savior, Christ, and we are Christ's body, suffering, dying, rising again and again together on November 5th, on November 6th, on November 7th, and every day that 